Many modern Muslim apologists have made their careers largely on two claims. The first is that the Quran is miraculously preserved, and the second is that the Bible is hopelessly corrupted. There are at least two things in common with these claims. The first is that they are both later developments, and the second is that they are both false. Let's start with the praise the Quran has for the prior scriptures. He has sent down on you the book with the truth, confirming what was before it. And he sent down the Torah and the gospel before this as guidance for the people. And now he has sent down the deliverance. Notice that in Surah 393, the messenger depends on the Torah to validate his claims. Say, bring the Torah and read it if you are truthful. Yet, how will they make you their judge when they have the Torah containing the judgment of God? And in their footsteps, we followed up with Jesus, son of Mary, confirming what was with him of the Torah. And we gave him the gospel containing guidance and light and confirming what was with him of the Torah. And finally, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who have been reciting the book before you. Many scholars have also noted that the Quran does not provide the basis for the entirely dismissive attitude that modern Muslims have regarding the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. The Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad is said to confirm what is with them. Obviously, this refers to a text that existed with the Jewish or Christian communities at the time of the Prophet. The people of the book are described as reciting verses of Allah. Many verses in the Quran refer to the people of the book as ones to whom God gave the book and who are asked to establish Torah and Injil. The Jews at the time of the Prophet are readers of the scripture, as are the Christians. In no verse in the Quran is there a denigrating remark about the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. Instead, there is respect and reverence. Any disparaging remarks were about the people of the book, individuals or groups, and their actions. Contrary to the general Islamic view, the Quran does not accuse Jews and Christians of altering the text of their scriptures, but rather of altering the truth which those scriptures contain. The people do this by concealing some of the sacred texts, by misapplying their precepts, or by altering words from their right position. However, this refers more to interpretation than to actual addition or deletion of words from the sacred books. The problem of alteration needs further study. This is something we hear frequently, not only from modern scholars, but also from classical Muslim sources. Since the authorized scriptures of Jews and Christians remain very much today as they existed at the time of the Prophet, it is difficult to argue that the Quranic references to Torah and Injil were only to the pure Torah and Injil as existed at the time of Moses and Jesus, respectively. If the texts have remained more or less as they were in the 7th century CE, the reverence the Quran has shown them at the time should be retained even today. Many interpreters of the Quran, from Tabari to Razi to Ibn Taymiyyah and even Qutb, appear to be inclined to share this view. The wholesale dismissive attitude held by many Muslims in the modern period towards the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity do not seem to have the support of either the Quran or the major figures of Tafsir. Muslims who want to argue that the Quran does, in fact, affirm the corruption of the Jewish and the Christian scriptures must deal with the fact that in the Quran, an actual name of one of the earlier scriptures never appears as the object of a verb of tampering. Furthermore, neither the word kitab nor any other term for a written document appears as the object of an alteration verb. But what did the early Muslim commentators think of the state of the Jewish and Christian scriptures? Dr. Gordon Nichol has done a thorough study of Muqattal's 8th century tafsir as well as Al-Tabari's tafsir to see what they had to say about the corruption of the prior scriptures. His methodology was to examine the eight Arabic roots associated with corruption, concealment, or alteration of the prior scriptures, as well as the specific Quranic verses that are usually used to substantiate accusations of corruption. Modern Muslims would like to be able to look at these early commentaries and to see claims about the corruption of the prior scriptures similar to the ones they make today. 
Unfortunately for them, this is not the case. Makatul does understand Surah 279 to refer to an alteration of the text of the Torah, but this was simply a change made by a small group of Jews and limited to Muhammad's name. Makatul writes, This is about how the chiefs of the Jews of Medina erased the description of Muhammad from the Torah and wrote other than his description and told the Jews something other than the description of Muhammad. Gordon Nichols summarizes Makatul's perspective. It is clear from the analysis of Makatul's exegesis of the tampering verses that he did not understand the verbs tamper and change to refer to an act of textual falsification of the earlier scriptures by the people of the book, either in the pre-Islamic past or in Medina at the time of Muhammad. Rather, he explains the verses containing these verbs with a variety of tampering actions which revolve around response to authority. He recounts stories of verbal alteration of divine commands from the history of the children of Israel. He also tells stories of inappropriate Jewish response to the prophet of Islam. The intact text of the Torah seems to remain solidly in the background of all of these various actions of tampering. Many of the allegations of tampering that Makatul discussed are related to Muhammad specifically. We'll talk about that after we summarize Al-Tabari's perspective. Tabari also seems to assume that the Torah was preserved at the time of Muhammad. He even has Muhammad say, I judge according to that which is in the Torah. It makes sense then that he wouldn't argue the Torah was generally corrupted, but he did argue for certain additions and deletions in the Torah in his exegesis of a few Quranic verses. Nichols states, in any case, the accusations offered by Tabari do not resemble the doctrine of scriptural corruption as it came to be known. They do not reflect the fully developed concept of a general corruption of the text of the Torah throughout the regions where Jews and Christians lived. The scenarios are one-dimensional. Much of Al-Tabari's argumentation requires the Torah to be intact. The Jewish leaders, according to him, saw the truth about Muhammad in their own Torah, however they concealed it from the illiterate common people who simply didn't know any better. Gord Nickel also draws our attention to something in these commentaries that other scholars have noted as well. Makatul and Tabari both appeal to an overarching narrative to explain the Quran. Imposing this narrative onto the Quranic text sometimes directed interpretation more than the text itself. Nickel quotes Wandsboro saying, It may be said of Makatul that the scriptural text was subordinate, conceptually, and syntactically to the narratio. Nickel continues, if the narrative framework was indeed paramount in Makatul's commentary, even to the point of subordinating the words of the Quran, then it is also able to influence the treatment of individual themes and motifs, such as tampering with earlier scriptures. The narrative structure is apparent in Tabari as well. The narrative pattern which dominates the development of the tampering motif in the commentaries of Makatul and Tabari is the response of the Jews of Medina to the claims from and about Muhammad. One of the most important indicators of this influential pattern is the frequency of identification of the object of tampering as the description of the Arabian prophet in the Torah. This expression occurs repeatedly in various forms. Often the object of tampering is simply Muhammad. Makatul most frequently mentions the matter of Muhammad then his description, his characteristics, his sending, and declaration. Thus, much of what Makatul and Tabari have to say on these issues is influenced by the narrative framework that they are imposing on the Quran, namely Muhammad's interaction with and rejection by the Jews in Medina. It was obvious to the commentators that Muhammad was the prophet described in the prior scriptures. So, their discussions of falsification of the Torah dealt primarily with information related to Muhammad. This is a far cry from the accusations of rampant corruption that we hear from modern Muslims. The prophethood of Muhammad in both commentaries, therefore, is based upon the alleged continuity of his recitations with the revelations of the past, rather than upon a claim of discontinuity because those scriptures had been previously falsified. So, how did we get to where we are today?
Well, some of this has to do with Ibn Hazm, who argued in part from his own presuppositions. So, for example, the doctrine of infallibility of the prophets was well established and developed by his time. Therefore, any so-called scripture that talked about a prophet sinning was likely corrupted. Or any text that talked about God using anthropomorphisms was corrupt, because that's not supposed to happen. Given the unfortunate consequences for critics of Islam throughout his period and after, his arguments were able to thrive. Some of them are still around today. More recently in the modern period, the Muslim accusation of the falsification of the biblical text took a quantum leap in the 19th century, in part through the work of al-Hindi. And as we've already discussed, modern Muslim apologists have developed these claims further. But for thinking Muslims, problems remain. One that stands out to me is that the Quran borrows from rabbinic legends, often mixing them in with stories from the Torah, as if it can't tell the difference. We see this in other Arabic literature as well. This combination of purported biblical quotations and almost literal translations of biblical verses is a striking feature of medieval Arabic literature that should always be kept in mind. As has been mentioned, sometimes parts of these quotations are based on Midrashic and later Jewish sources, taken by Muslims to be an integral part of scripture itself. But any reasonable person would acknowledge that mistaking Midrashic material for scripture in medieval Muslim sources indicates a lack of knowledge on the part of the author. Why isn't the same thing true for the author of the Quran? Further, the Quran clearly contradicts the books it thinks it's affirming. Additionally, the Quran knows of the Torah and Gospel, but spends much of its time borrowing from later expansions of both. And the Quran treats mystical exegesis as if it's historical fact. These are difficult issues because there is simply no way that the Quran can be seen as being knowledgeable about its sources or in line with the Gospel and Torah. As Muslims have become more and more aware of this over the centuries, their claims about wholesale corruption of the Jewish and Christian scriptures have become stronger. Their evidence for these claims has not. See you next time.